Standard reinforcement learning or temporal difference learning, as we have learned it in the first section, is rather inefficient. One problem is the very slow update of the states. So if we consider a very simple variant of the um, system that we have considered so far, where we have these states, and we have one absorbing state. So the box in the this state in the very right is the absorbing state. Let's assume the boxes are all initialized with some values. Um, okay, so let's put it in. Three, four, one, one, minus three, minus five, two, five, minus three, minus one, three. And we know this has a value of zero, right? Now, as the, and we place the agent in some of these states and then it has the choice of going left or right. Yeah. So if this one is about for some time and then in the end moves from this state, with a 3 in there, to the last state, then it learns that the, that the value here should actually be minus 1. Yeah. But it has learned nothing about the other states. If then it wanders about again and again, then it updates, eventually updates this state to minus 2 correctly, it leaves this at minus 1. Yeah. So it has learned the value of a second state, right? So it needs to run through this over and over again until the true value sort of gradually propagates back into the, uh, through the states. Now, one can improve on this by not only updating um, the the value of the state where which I just leave, but also the previous states. So let's assume we put the agent here in this box, and it moves right straight to the right. Yeah. Um, then it learns from here to there that the value two is wrong. It should be four. Yeah. And now. At that moment, we don't update any other uh, values because we have just started. Yeah? If then the agent moves from here to there, it learns that the value here should be minus 4 rather than 5. Now the value here has changed from 5 to minus 4. So it has changed by 9. Yeah? And now that can help us to update also the value of the previous state to correct that. Because that used to be the correct value for the 5 that was in here. But now it should be reduced by 9, like this state. So it is corrected along with this one. Yeah. So we put a... If it was a 4, minus 9 would be minus 5. Yeah. So now the system has learned in one go the two states. Now that has... That would in principle work in such a one-dimensional thing. Yeah. So you could actually start here on this side and let it run once and then it would learn all the different values in one go. Yeah. There are problems if you if you consider a two dimensional environment 
And for example, you imagine uh, for some reason the agent is running in a circle, right? Then if you would really do this strict updating, then it would update this point twice and then it would get a wrong value, right? So it's maybe not a good value, get not a good strategy to update it by strictly the same amount by which you update the current state, sort of. So it might not be a good idea to update the previous, the values of the previous states by as much as you update the value of the current state. So there should be maybe a decay, so the, the past should be corrected less in order to avoid these kinds of, of problems. And this is what is, uh, what is being done in what's called TD Lambda learning. So what you do here is, um, so this is a standard learning rule that we had above. So we update the value of the current state, S of t. We update it, so we look at the value of t plus 1 by the value that uh, the next state has, that is vt of s t plus 1, uh, the value of the future state plus the reward. And now what what is added to this is that you also update the values of the states that have been previously visited. So s t minus t dash. So these, because of the minus t, these are the states that have been previously visited. And you update these, right, so the, going from vt to vt plus 1, by the difference of the value of the current state. This is the update of the current state, and this is the value, the current value of previous states, right? So you simply correct the previous states by the adaptation of the current state. If this prefactor would be 1, then we had the situation that we have, that I've just described, that would allow this one here to update all states from left to right. Um, but typically one chooses a value somewhere between 0 and 1 to avoid these problems and one takes the exponent t dash so the previous um the value of the previous uh state is updated most and then as you go into the past they will be updated less and less If you have a system, if you have an environment with no absorbing state, so the agent will never finish the job, yeah, then you might run into trouble because the agent moves all the time, uh, that reward will add up to infinity, right? If you have, let's say, a reward of uh, minus one for each step that it takes, it will just go to minus infinity. Or if you're more positive, right, you give the agent a reward of plus one for each successful uh, step that it does, then the expected reward will end up plus infinity. So this would, for for instance, be the case if you have a situation like uh, pole balancing, right? So imagine you have a little cart here that can move left and right. And you have a pole that's being balanced, right? So in this case, right now, uh, and what the cart can do, it can move left and right, and it's limited, right? It, it's limited here in the left and right, so it has to balance the pole uh, within that one meter or whatever. Right now, it should probably move to the right, uh, so that it balances the pole. The state in this situation might be described by um, an angle, this angle, and maybe the position of the card. Uh, would be two-dimensional state space. Maybe also velocity that, that can vary. Now, the job for this agent is to balance this pole. And so you would give it positive reward for every second that it manages to balance the pole. And if you would just add that up, and if the agent is 
um, successful, then this reward would add up to infinity. So you have an ill-posed problem. What you can do about this is you can um, discount the reward. Right? So um, the expected reward would not be just the sum over the reward that it accumulates, but as you go further into the future, the reward is discounted by a gamma factor. Yeah, so t goes to infinity, so the exponent becomes larger and larger. t0 is the current time step, and you can imagine that if this is a factor between 0 and 1, then with this exponent, the reward in the very future would not count anymore, basically. Right? So this is a way to define, to well define expected reward if you have a, an environment with no absorbing states. Now, in order to reflect this expected reward in the value function, you need to discount, um, you need the discount factor there as well. So, the update rule that we had above would be corrected by just adding this gamma factor here. So, the new value of state S is the reward that you get by taking action A in this state S plus the value in the future state, so S of S and A is the state where the agent goes into, but discounted by gamma. And if you do that, you end up exactly with this equation of expected reward. Because, of course, this value contains also information about the value one step ahead, but that would get two gammas, right? Gamma times gamma because it's two steps ahead, and that in the end leads to this gamma exponent expression that you have up here. I've mentioned already that it's also possible to deal with non-deterministic deterministic transitions. But you have to adapt the equations a bit by that, for that. Right? So let's assume we have a transition. We have transition probabilities. So if the system is in state S and takes action A, then it will not deterministically go into a new state S dash. But there will be prob probabilities that are expressed here as P of S dash given S and A. Now if you had these probabilities, you could update the value of the state by adding the reward that you get for taking that action in that state and a weighted average over the values of the state you might end up in or you might transition to. And the probabilities are these uh, P of S dash given S and A. The problem is these probabilities are not known, so they have to be learned along with the values. So one possibility would be to really just count the numbers you end up in a particular state if you are, uh, to count how often you end up in state S dash if you are in state S and take action A. So you can assume these probabilities. However, that's expensive in terms of, of memory capacity at least. Um, so what you actually do is you learn the so-called Q function. That's expressed down here. The Q function assigns a value to a particular state action combination. Right? So the values are not on, now not assigned to a state but to a state action pair. If you have that, it's easy to calculate the value of a state by simply taking the maximum over Q over all actions. Right? Obviously, the agent and would take the action that promises the highest Q value. Yeah? And that's described down here. So the action taken would be 
the one that gives the highest Q value if you run over all A dash possible actions. Now how do we update Q? Now if we had a deterministic situation, we would update our Q for state S and action A by the reward of S and A and the value of the state we transition to. Right? S dash would be the deterministically determined new state given we are in state S and take action A. However, in the probabilistic case, where we have non-deterministic transitions, this S dash is not clearly determined, right? Sometimes maybe with 20% it would be, you would go left, and with 50% you would go down, and with 30% you would go right or something. So you would need to average over the different states. I mean, if we had the probabilities up there, we could actually do a similar trick like here, yeah, but we don't have that. So what we simply do is um, we have a we use a so-called leaky integrator. So we don't replace the old value, which is QT of S and A, completely by this new value, but we simply replace a fraction of it by the new value which is this one here, uh, and alpha is the fraction that determines how much we replace by the new value, and we keep partly the old value. Uh, so let me illustrate that. So, So let this be the Q value, and the initial Q value should be 1. Yeah. And, and now let's not worry about the different states, etc. Let's just say there come sort of um, two different values, namely 1 and 0 and they come with 50% chance. Uh, so let's just look what happens with Q if we update it according to such a rule where we just assume the value that's that, that we just get, or if we update it to according to this rule where we just replace 20% of the Q value by the incoming value and leave 80% um, at the old value. So let's first do the, the deterministic thing. So we get the values 0 and 1 with 50% um, probability. And we start with a, with a value of 1. Yeah. Now let's assume the next value is also 1. I mean, then obvious, obviously we take that value. The next value would be 0, so we would just take the 0 value. Then maybe a 0 again, and then a one, ge 1 again, a 0 a 1, a 1, etc. Yeah? So in that case, so if we use this version here, the value would just jump back and forth between the two possibilities. And the two possibilities correspond to um, the two S dash possible values that we here assume. Now if we use this rule down here, it's different. So we add 1 and we get another 1. So that would be of course, again a 1. So we have the same value. Do a little cross here. Now if the next value is a 0 and we replace 80% of this value, we don't set the value exactly to 0, but we just ex replace 80%, 20% uh, of that by 0, then we get an 0 0.8. Yeah. The next value is a 0 again, so we go down another 20%. The next value is a 1, so we go up 20% on the way from this value to this value, so we have a value here, let's say. 
Then we go down again a little bit. We go up a little bit and go up a little bit even further. Right, and what happens is that depending on whether you have zeros or one, it sort of zigzags back and forth, always just moving 20%. And it will average in the end around this 0.5, which is a theoretical prediction. Yeah? So that's what you get, that's what you can achieve if you use this leaky integrator or leaky, leaky summation as it would be probably better called. If alpha is large, you jump back and forth more. If alpha is small, you jump back and forth less, but you also converge slower to the true value. Yeah, so this is a parameter you have to think about. Okay, I said um, that using this Q value is more efficient than estimating these probabilities because if you have 1,000 states and 10 actions in each state, then this would be 10 million, uh, 1,000 times 1,000 times 10, 10 million probabilities you have to estimate. While Q only has the variables S and A, so that would be 10,000 rather than 10 million, and that's a big difference. Right, so therefore, this is more efficient than estimating these p's, these probabilities, and then going from there. Now, if you have a probabilistic system, so if the transitions are not deterministic, you have a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Yeah. Exploration means you try different things, right? So if you're in a state and you have three possible actions, you try all of them out in order to figure out, okay, what will be the expected reward if you take that action? Exploitation means if you've learned already something about the the payoffs of the actions in that state, then you should take the action that gives you the, that promises the largest payoff, right? So that would be exploiting what you have learned already. And this is a trade-off because um, if you too quickly to the, go into the exploitation mode, so you might not have learned the um, the expected rewards, so the, your Q values might just not be right. Yeah? And I want to illustrate this with this example here. So let's assume the agent always starts in state S1, and then it can assume, uh, can take the action A1 or 0. And from then on, it just runs through this whole thing, so there's just one action to take. Yeah? So if it takes action 1, it gets a reward of 1 here, it transitions to S4, it gets another reward of 1, and transitions to S5. Right? So quite obviously the expected reward along this line, along this path, would be 2. Yeah. So... So Q of S1 and A equals 1 would be 2. Now let's assume it has, and this is something that the agent can figure out with I mean, going through there once, right? Uh, but let's assume it has sort of tried four times the two actions A equals 0 and A equals 1 and uh, with equal probability. So it has chosen this twice and this twice. Now if it chooses this twice and it once goes over the top path here and once it goes through, um, takes this lower path here, right? Then the system if it if you just average over this and, and and don't don't worry about the details of um this this leaky summation 
right? Then we will, would get a Q of S1 and A equals 0 of, well, if you go this way, we have a reward of minus 2. If you go this way, we have a reward of plus 4. Huh? So the reward on average, averaging just over these two trials, would be 1. Uh, because the minus 3 and the plus 3 cancel out. However, if you look at this one here, we see that the probability of getting a minus 2 is 0.1, while the probability of going down here is 0.9. Yeah? So this would be the estimated Q value after the two trials, which happen to be one up here and one down here, but the true Q value would be so many so this is estimated and this would be true q of s1 and a equals 0 so that would be 0 0.1 times minus 2 plus 0.9 times 4. Yeah. And that would be, I mean, if this were a 1, then this would be 4, but we have to reduce this by 10%, so that would be 3.6, and then we reduce it by another 0.2, so that would be 3.4. So here we see that by just averaging over the two tries that we had, we get a too low value by chance. And if we would now decide to always choose A equals 1, because there we get reliably a value of 2, which is greater than this 1, then we would just have not done the right thing, right? Because the true probability or the true expected reward here um, for a equals 0 would be 3.4. Yeah. So you have to try often enough um, the different options before you decide on one particular um, strategy or policy if you're in a, determin you a non-deterministic system. Yeah. Reinforcement learning has successfully been used also for game playing, for training a game playing agent. Now in that case, uh, you have two players. So how do you deal with the situation that you have two players and you want to train reinforcement learning? Well, that's relatively simple and illustrated in this picture. You simply treat the other agent as part of the environment and then it becomes obviously it becomes a probabilistic environment because the other agent might change its policy on the way. Um, yeah, but otherwise it goes through st uh, straightforward, right? So let's assume we have such an environment, and we have an we have a sort of the this is a state in which the game is right now, and we have a player A and a player B that alternate uh, in, in their decision, right? So in this case, player B starts first, and uh, the goal of, now let me check. Yeah, so the goal of, and the goal of player, uh, of, uh, player A is to reach this, absorbing state, while the goal of player B is to reach this absorbing state. Right? So let's assume B starts, it moves down, then it's the turn of player A, it moves left, then it's the turn of player B, it turns down again, then it's turn, uh, the turn of player A, it moves left again, etc. So that way 
you have this path. Now, if you only look at the role of player A, for player A, it looks like it takes a decision. Now, it is here, takes a decision, namely left, and it ends up down. So, this is a pro probabilistic decision, probabilistic transition to this down field, to the lower left field, due to the action left. Then it is, uh, takes the action left again, and it adds, ends up here. Uh, it could also have ended up here if player B had decided to move to the left, right? So the other player adds some randomness to the transitions, um, to the transitions here for player A. And in this case, player A has won, right? Because player B has done dumb moves. Okay, so the last extension I want to talk about is large is, is an extension for large state spaces. In particular in games, uh, because you have many, many positions like Backgammon, for example, that's a game that has been uh, played by successfully trained with reinforcement learning. Um, these games have a huge state space, right? So there are many different ways uh, uh, the stones can be on the on the board. Um, much too large for the standard discrete reinforcement learning to work that we have seen so far. So what you can do in these cases, you can approximate the value function by neural network, let's say. So you need some fun function approximator that works in the state space but has much fewer parameters than you would need to represent all the values of the different states. So these were a few simple extensions to address some problems that you might run into in reinforcement learning. Uh, there's of course much more to it, but uh, I will stop here.